My name is Stephen Evans, and I'm the Executive Director of PhotoFest, and I want to thank you for joining us today for another in our series of Creative Conversations Digital. This is a program that we began in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but one that's allowed us to connect with our audience internationally and, and that we plan to continue uh, in, far into the future. Today, it's going to be my pleasure to talk with Azu Wagbogu, who um, has uh, many different roles that he fulfills. Um, and I'll give you a bio of Azu's. He's a um, impresario, uh, curator, and uh, creator of institutions. Um, and it's very exciting to have him here today. He's also a contributor to our book, our companion book to the latest PhotoFest uh, 2020 biennial, which is called African Cosmologies. PhotoFest major institutional and indiv individual support comes from the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation, Inc., the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission for the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors, and all of the supporters of the PhotoFest Annual Fund. And we couldn't do this program without them. I'd also like to thank the staff of PhotoFest, um, all of which uh, are involved in the creation of our programs. But in particular, I'd like to thank Max Fields, our Associate Curator and Director of Publishing, and Vinod Hobson, our Director of Communications for um, making this program happen and um, putting everything together. So I, I thank them too. Azu Wagbogu is the founder and director of African Artists Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Lagos, Nigeria. And he was elected as the interim director, head curator of the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa from June 2018 through August 2019. He serves as the founder and director of Lagos Photo Festival, an annual international arts festival of photography held in Lagos. And he is the creator of Art Face Africa, a virtual space to discover and learn about contemporary African art. Azu Nogogu served as juror for the Dutch Doc Pop Cap Photography Awards, the World Press Photo, Prisma Photography Award, Greenpeace Photo Award, New York Times Portfolio Review, W. Eugene Smith Award for Photo España, for Foam Paul Huff Award, the Welcome Photography Prize, and is a regular juror for, inter for organizations such as Lens Culture and Magnum. For the past 20 years, he's curated private collections for various prominent individuals and corporations in Africa. He obtained a master's degree in public health from the University of Cambridge. He lives and works in Lagos, Nigeria. So I welcome today Azu Wagbogu. There you are. Hi, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> thank you for your generous introduction. And you're you're we're talking to you today in Amsterdam, yes? I've been here the last um, four weeks now, so interested to be away from home. Um, well, thanks for making the time. Um, it, it's great to have you here, and I know that we have a lot of uh, a lot of topics to talk about. I was I was interested to start maybe at um, what might be a traditional beginning and hear a little bit about your personal journey, how you became involved from how you went from public health to working with art and photography and uh, the founding of uh, the foundation. Oh yeah, that's a really, well, you can imagine that I often have to, have to explain myself in this way, but, uh, and um, I need some, I actually think about it. It feels really providential. So, um, it was, I've always been involved in art and curated and I've, I've always had an interest. And um, when I returned to Lagos in 2006 in September, 
I quickly found myself involved in a couple of exhibitions that I, that I was super motivated to um, to to um, to develop and to initiate and to curate. Um, and afterwards, they just really developed from the um, in 2010. Um, I decided to create the League of Filter Festival because I realized at the time that um, the the need to create an intervention in the perception and the representation of Africa was uppermost in my mind because I had come from both worlds, you know, having lived in the UK for quite a while and, you know, my own experience of living in Lagos in Nigeria and traveling around the continent really meant that I felt like it was important that we should use the medium of photography with its power, its immediacy and its agency um, to begin to redress the sort of representation of Africa in mainstream media and then also in visual culture. And I think I have a bad connection, which is what popped me off before and I missed most of your response, but I know the audience was able to appreciate it. So um, thank you. And um, can we talk about, um, the African Artists Foundation and and it, the work that it does and what what's the relationship? I've always wondered what is the relationship between the African Artists Foundation and Lagos Photo, for example. Oh yeah, so um, also another really good question. Uh, the African Artists Foundation developed Lagos Photo Festival three years after um, its initiation, after its formation, and um, somehow I feel like if uh, Lagos Photo Festival has sort of cannibalized the African Artists Foundation, because photography is the fastest and the most impactful art form on the continent, or has been for the last decade. Um, and so with, and also the fact that it's a, it's a repetitive, recursive process to curate and to organize a festival from one year to the next. And as we've seen with the, um, interest and the hunger and the desire for event-led art productions and situations all over the world with art fairs, biennials, um, annuals, all of this sort of festival economy um, really drove the art world pre-Covidian times. And I think, you know, we need to reinvent and imagine a new society, a new um, situation as we, you know, navigate through COVID-19. Well, and and the world in general, I guess. Um, I know that uh, in the in the text that you provided for the PhotoFest book, uh, I, I I love the the very last sentence of it when you talked about the work of uh, Lagos Photo, um, and I'll just I'll just read it now. Okay. And this Houston, and this. Houston is why the visual language which Lagos Photo promotes, one which communicates across the barriers of geography, language, ethnicity, faith, gender, and sexuality is more necessary than ever. Um, and I, you, um, and before in the in the letter uh, that you that you sent for us to publish, you talked a little bit about the history of the festival and some of the topics. Um, I know that you prepared a presentation and I wonder if we could put that up and it can just play in the background as we talk. Um, sure. I think uh, I think that'd be that'd be good for some people to get a visual sense of the work that you've been doing. Um, and Correct me if I'm wrong, but what wasn't uh, Lagos Photo the the first international biennial or art contemporary art event um, that was created in certainly in Nigeria and per, perhaps in Africa? I know um, in Africa we uh, the the Bamako Biennial, which is you know the the forerunner and the older, but certainly Nigeria was the the harbinger of a lot of these situations as an annual event or as a biennial, definitely in Lagos. And remind us how long Bamako has been going. Uh, Bamako is before uh, before Lagos photo. Um, at least twenty, I'd say they've had uh, Lagos is eleven years, so they've had about maybe twenty five years. 
Bamako. But it's at it's a bang also, but Lagos for the Nam also. We probably have the same, uh, we probably had about roughly the same events, number of events. But um the fact that Lagos photo happens annually and Bamako happens as a biannual creates a different sort of rhythm. I apologize to everyone. I, um, I'm having some internet issues here at home. So hopefully you can hear me again. Um, and I, I got uh, booted off of the connection, but I, I don't hear anything. Uh, Azu, are you still there? Yeah, I hear you, Stephen, it's fine. Okay, great. And I, I put on my uh, headphones too. I changed my headphones. Maybe that was part of the issue. Um, and uh, let's talk about the importance of the African Artist Foundation and, and the work that it does. Um, in this presentation, uh, you showed a, a rather impressive facility where you're doing, you're offering residencies. You wanna talk about that program a little bit? Yeah, um, one of the situation, one of the things, one of the real factors that creates this representation of Africa in in this sort of Afro-pessimistic way, because a lot of artists, a lot of photographers coming to the coming to the, on the continent on a very short-term project, and they have to report, you know, do a five-day visit, piloting them, piloting them out, and leave with a very dramatic story, representation of of the situation of whatever situation they are dealing with, or they've been tasked to address. But I think. Um, with the residency, we're able to invite these leading artists, photographers to dialogue and to be dialogical with our local artists, photographers, thinkers, writers, curators, whatever, to create work that is more balanced, more nuanced. And we're very deliberate about this. Um, so we like to find opportunity to find this sort of um, framework where we can get artists who are thinking along a certain line to network with local artists thinking along the same line to create work that is more meaningful and impactful and you know that creates um, opportunity for us to really have a better understanding of the situation. So I highlighted a few of those um, in the presentation here, the work of Kadir von Lohausen, where he you know follows a diamond story is a perfect example of talking about a desperate, difficult situation in Africa that involves a lot of problems, but um, in a very nuanced, very balanced way that illuminates the story and makes everyone better informed, you know, rather than just focusing on maybe the dead, the drowned kids in the pool or in the in the mine. You know, he really follows the story and we like that template. And that's what the residency offers, the opportunity to support artists who are really keen on developing the story and being more true to the narrative and in in a sense too um in the w one of the topics that i know you've discussed before is um this idea of afro pessimism and so you're helping foster developing stories that that give nuance and 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 fight against this this tenet of afro pessimism yeah if you look at the the thematic representation of the festival over the last 10 years, I believe the first four editions really had that sort of thrust where we were really trying to provide a more new and more balanced story, more balanced representation to challenge this sort of Afro-pessimistic representation of Africa. And that is to say, 
the image of Africa that is a hopeless, um, difficult, intractable, complex um, society that you know really isn't going anywhere. But um, I think we we got to the point where we felt we had moved on from there. Well, we felt that there was enough agency, we were less insecure about, uh, or less defensive, if you like, about the image or the way outsiders perceive Africans. We're more interested in our own agency, what we can do to design our own futures. And, and that's why you see with the evolution of the thematic of the festival, we, we started sort of focusing on a more pan-African approach or a more agent, um, a more sort of creative, innovative, um, futuristic approach to visual storytelling. And I think, you know, at the stage we are now, we also we keep evolving, you know, we I think we've moved away from sort of just narrative. We're looking more at um, agency and ownership. And that's what we think we should be at. And um, this this concept of adapting, you mentioned it a little bit earlier in our conversation. Could you tell us a little bit about what the next edition, uh, the upcoming edition uh, of Lagos Photo is and how it can be experienced and what's the concept behind the rapid response restitution? So yeah, I think just before the COVID situation, we, um, I invited a, a really good friend of mine who had worked with in the past, um, who had worked in an ethnographic museum, um, commenting the list to um, undergo research around the topic of restitution because it's a really fascinating topic for me. And I thought um, I just didn't want to create an intervention around it without actually researching the situation. And so we invited her to Lagos in February and we traveled around um, the country, visiting municipal museums all over Nigeria. And um, the the thing that we left with was the idea of creating humble home museums. And, um, and then COVID happened. And then we were confined at home. So the, the, the idea of rapid response restitution was to use the agency of photography to remediate this very complex situation of restitution. Because uh, the word is so horrible, so frightening, so, um, if you like, aggressive. So, and we, I'm also quite, quite uncomfortable with the idea of restitution because it's so complex to unpack. But when we think about it through the home museum, through creating the, the kind of cosmology from your own home, the kind of stimulating, tapping into the very power of photography to create visual intellect, to create a, a care for your own environment, you know, then we're forced into a convenient situation. We're all stuck at home. We look around our own environment, we begin to take an interest in the things that are around us. I think that allows us the agency to spark a very important way of looking at um, restitution from a, our immediate environment. Because when you talk to people on the street about restitution, they don't really care. They don't really see the value of bringing our heritage back home. And I thought, how do we spark this interest and what role can photography play in stimulating this? Um, visual intellect, if you like, and allowing people to understand the power of uh, of um, bringing a heritage home and thinking about it and learning from it. And a lot of times, people think about these objects as merely objects for worship, but a lot of these objects were objects that were designed for instruction, for play. You know, and when you think about people as consistently um, in survival mode or in this sort of spiritual existence, you it makes you imagine them as sort of less than human. And I think one of the things about the home museum is to imagine your own home, your own world, your own cosmology, your own situation as a museum, as a center of your peace. And the power of photography to create a democratic representation of that home museum and transferring that to an online platform where we host your world for everyone else to participate. I think that's a very powerful thing. And we've got, as you see, we, with the, the letter that we sent out to the world, we translated yes. many, many languages into Pidgin English, into Russian, Chinese, French, local um, Swahili, uh, Zulu. 
we really wanted to get this word out in the most, um, as I say, humble way, because we want to meet people at their point of need. We want people to share their own world to us and to bring it into a situation where we can engage with it. And are, how is this being presented online? So we, we got a, a, a collective, a young collective called the Birds of Knowledge, and we got them to interpret and work with the data. I think it's a very incredible idea because these are a bunch of young artists, you know, all in their 20s and below, who um, loved the idea and wrote to us and, and invited themselves into the platform and they want to work to design the platform, the online platform, so that we can host the online museum. We don't want to drive it. We don't want to, we want, we want the people who use it to create it. I mean, when you think about the architecture of the museum, you think about the architecture of the museum in two ways, the intellectual architecture and the, uh, the physical space that houses the, the content. And the um, physical space that houses the content is online and it's being designed by the Beds of Knowledge, a collective of young artists from uh, New Zealand, Cameroon, Nigeria, um, Tunisia, um, Germany, um, I think we've got the French, the French student as well, and it will be designed online and we'll share it and we'll host it during the festival. We also intend to have public space exhibitions as we always do with Lagos Photo. Yeah, and in, in those, um, I noticed, it, at least in the beginning, um, and I'm not sure if you're still doing this, but you, you're also using the festival to rehabilitate spaces, uh, to go into disused uh, spaces? Yeah, so we have the slogan, art reclaiming public spaces. So a lot of spaces in Lagos, when, you know, Nigeria, um, Lagos used to be the, the capital of the, of the country, and then they moved to Abuja. So a lot of federal government buildings were left abandoned when this move happened. And so we, we, um, we are very active in reclaiming these spaces for art during the festival. And we try and find these spaces, we refurbish them and we, um, we use to utilize them for the festival. Terrific. Um, and you had a call for submissions that ended just recently. How did that go in terms of the home? We got entries, we got entries from China, from Senegal, from Nairobi. We've got entries from Russia. It's been incredible. The home museum is such a, you know, photography is the most democratic tool and language of our era, of our age. And the fact that, you know, most people have smartphones today, you know, means that we can really utilize this wonderful, brilliant democratic tool to begin to remediate our cultural heritage and not just for Africa, but also for the rest of the world. Um, and that's why we're not too surprised with the sort of responses that we've got so far. Um, can we talk about your work at the Sites Museum? And, and the importance of, of that institution? I mean, Africa, you know, desperately needs a museum for the future. And um, a contemporary art museum is, we have a lot of um, historical museums, a lot of museums that were built by um, colonial powers at the time. But to create a museum that is representative of the history of Africa, and it's forward looking is super, super, super important. Um, the Zeiss Museum is, um, was, um, came on the, on the scene with huge promises and we're, we're hoping that the museum will fulfill its promise. Okay. And it's only a few years old. It's only a few years old. It's only what, three years old now, four years, three, four years old, going on four. So it's, I think, you know, it's got to undergo the process of evolution and we need bold, strong characters to drive that institution and to, and we need artists to also have a voice to be able to understand that every single space on this continent belongs to them. You know, if you're an artist on the continent working and living here, 
it's your space. You know, no one should tell you any differently. And um, how about the role of the curators there? And um, are, uh, is it fostering more of a curatorial culture um, in South Africa, but also perhaps the continent? It aims to, and um, if it achieve, achieves that over time, we will know. But um, in my time there, um, when I was a chief curator there and the director there, I, I did as much as I could to give a lot of agency to the curators there and autonomy to them and to guide them as well. So, I mean, you can't, you cannot run a museum without, a, as I said earlier, on, the intellectual architecture that guides and shapes and provides a vision for the museum. And if you haven't got curators to do this, if you haven't got thinkers to do this, then it's really hard. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's hard to, you know, I mean, there's a COVID interruption since, you know, since January, so we don't really know there's a new director. So it's hard to judge um, the progress and the success of the festival so far, but I think, um, yeah, we have to, we have to be confident and hopeful. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I can't wait to be able to go there and to see it. Um, architecturally, a very impressive structure too. And um, I, I just, um, I'm admiring the work that you've done there and uh, helping to, you know, helping it as it's uh, in its uh, childhood and adolescence. <laughs> no, the last two exhibitions that I curated or was involved in at the museum was the, an exhibition called Still Here Tomorrow to High Five You Yesterday. And Still Here Tomorrow was a, a sort of Afrofuturistic exhibition that really focused on utopia, dystopia, and that tension between the two. And it sort of was a, a harbinger of the COVID situation. And so now we're in this sort of COVID situation where it's a sort of dystopic situation. We're actually able to test out the ideas from the futuristic situation and actually see the work and see our preparedness to design and create new institutions, new structures, new ideas for the future. I mean, we talk about um, when we talk about Weizmoka, I think Africa really needs a different sort of museum for the future, less about mm -hmm. the iconic building, but more about a humble museum with connective tissue that is able to really penetrate society. You know, we don't want to have a museum that has a sort of hierarchical structure or follow the sort of elitist Western model. We want a museum to really bring in all the creative energies, to have a network, to have a back room, to have studios, to be, to, you know, to sort of demystify itself. I think we really need a medium to be humble and to be um, energetic and metabolic. That's the sort of idea that I want to see happen right now. Well, it, it sounds like um, uh, a festival model for a museum, which I which I love, yeah. or at least some 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 festival models. You know, in terms of the, I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about that, but also that in relationship to the way you've approached the curation of uh, this year's edition of Lagos Photo and inviting a young team in um, that perhaps has roots, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to do that, to, to reach out into the community and um, to, to find uh, pathways for artists that haven't had a chance to uh, show their work in that way before. Um, and do you think um, do, does the does the Zeitz have studios? Does it have this kind of metabolic component to it, or it's it can it's on the way? So we, um, while I was there as well, we I was involved in an exhibition um, called Five Bob, and it was about um, the history of painting in contemporary painting in. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has produced some of the most incredible contemporary artists for, you know, from Africa. And um, I said the show was curated by um, Tandazani Dalakma, who was at the time working 
she's still in the museum actually. And um, one of the things that we did at the time was to invite two artists to, or three artists actually, to use the museum space as a studio. And so they actually made the paintings there and produced work there. And we're still here tomorrow to high five you yesterday. Um, we invited an artist to paint a mural on the wall in the museum. It was such a, an incredible production and still a little bit sad because in the end you have to paint over the wall. Um, but it was, he made it an incredible mural and that really condensed all the ideas in the show in the very last room of the exhibition. Um, so I think that's the way I want to see museums operate as a community that invites people in and, um, and isn't, you know, either scared to take risks. And what's, the, um, what's been the relationship of uh, Lagos Photo to institutions? Have they been able to help foster artists to make uh, more connections with institutions to enter collections, both uh, in Africa and elsewhere in the world? I think that is the one thing that I can be, you know, we can be completely, you know, proud of that we can reference and say, look, this happened since Lagos Photo. Um, and um, so, yeah, that has happened significantly. And, it, you know, photography is such a powerful tool, as we keep on saying it. And it's really opened up Africa to the rest of the world. And, you know, it's given a lot of autonomy and agency to artists, not just photographers, painters, sculptors. I know a lot of artists today, um, visual artists today, make pictures of their work and they share it on social platforms. And through these platforms, they're able to connect with leading institutions, leading collectors. And the success of that is incredible and gives a lot of... Um, provide an economy to the artist, but there's a risk to it because um, that, that direct line sometimes means that certain narratives are not able to enter the canon of art history or enter a canon of a movement of art because it's just quickly, it's quickly catalyzed by the market. And, um, and I think curators today need to focus on artists in their studios, but also need to pay attention to these social platforms to be able to look at the work that these guys are doing and find a way to give it language and bring it into the canon where it's not reduced to, or articulated just through the market or who's selling water, what, you know, what's, what the market is interested in. It's really important to pay attention to the thematics and the idea that these artists are expounding. And I think that's a very crucial part of being a curator in um, the 21st century. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, that's, a, it's um, absolutely essential, I think. Um, and let's talk about you, you, the, um, the other day we were talking and you mentioned that you had um, one foot in Europe and one foot in Lagos. And um, how is that, um, Let's talk a little bit about the work that you do internationally, curating for the recent, the exhibition that opened just a few days ago for Breda Photo and for other organizations. Um, what's your philosophy about doing that work? Um, it's really simple. So I'm in the Netherlands and um, in Africa, most people know the artist like, an artist like, would know an artist like Mary Sibande, but she's largely unknown here. And, um, and so inviting Mary to be part of this festival and looking at, watching the reaction of, you know, suburban middle-class Dutch families coming to see the exhibition, it's just like, it's actually quite humorous to me, you know, they're like mouth wide open. They're just, you know, they're just wild by the work. And I, that sort of encourages you to think, wow, I mean, you take for granted that this artist is well known and respected and recognized, but well, large swathes of community internationally do not actually have a clue. And that's, I think, a very big part of public space exhibition, the ability to connect with the average person on the street, to connect with the, with, um, the wide range of demographics. So 
Um, that's really interesting. And the other thing I like about my set of the the networks that I form internationally is I'm able to create, um, contribute um, essays or be part of a book project or be part of a um, um, future museology idea because this is something that I'm very keen on. Um, uh, I, I, you know, at Breda, for example, we the one of the curators actually made a is a great photographer himself, and he he made a really interesting book, and I contributed the essay to it a few months, maybe a year ago, and then he presented it to me yesterday. I was so moved and touched to see how beautiful the production was, and so it's it's these sort of situations are priceless. You know, they happen more easily here, and um, I'm able to transpose those ideas back home as well. Any um, any plans for museum founding in your future? Ah, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, let's see too closely. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I mean, you, I think that you, I mean, you definitely have the passion for it. Um, that's uh, it's inevitable, you know. It's yeah. inevitable. Nature, they say, I brought a vacuum. Um, it's inevitable that with all the ability that we have, the energy, the creativity, it's inevitable that with all of the things that we've been through as a people um, on the continent that we we design and come up with a museum that is fit for purpose, that does not ape another sort of colonial mindset. We have to completely decolonize the idea of a museum and to think about a museum as a network of connective tissues. And that's really what I want to see happen. You know, we can, and a lot of the leading architects who've been involved in these iconic, you know, totemic museums, they're also rethinking what that idea or does in a different situation in Africa. How do we create a museum that really works for the people? I think, um, you know, the champions are coming together and I think we get to do it. Well, um... I would love to know more about what happens uh, when it gets closer. It's um, I, I think your your concept about um, these connective tissues and and the that kind of uh, museum as a metabolism, as opposed to something aping other institutional structures that um, are colonialist is is absolutely necessary at this moment. And we're seeing that, I mean, I think we're seeing that in, um, I don't know how close attention you pay to it into what's going on in the United States, but with um, the uh, conversations and dialogues and, and tension around uh, race that's happened here this summer, um, it's also overflowed into a lot of controversy in museums. And I think that we see uh, some structures that aren't prepared to take that on and and that's what's what's being exposed um so i'm um i, I don't know i'm i'm happy to to hear this kind of optimism about making a new making a new ins type of institution a new museum a new communication strategy um and it coming from your experience in doing lagos photo and um, the african artist foundation um, if there's anyone who's watching us and you've got a question, please feel free to send it. Um, it's about a quarter of the hour, so we have a few minutes left and we'd love to hear from you. If anyone has um, something for uh, Azu or myself uh, about uh, the subjects that we've talked about today. And um, what's, uh, who are you looking at now? What are you thinking about for, I know you have, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. You have Lagos photo coming up very soon. Um, next steps after that? Um, projects in the works? Yeah, we've got a few projects in the works. We've got a few, um, um, I think if you look at the dominant theme in representation and contemporary visual culture today, um, it's a lot of figuration, even in photography in relation to Africa and its diaspora, it's a lot of um, figuration and representation and 
um, portraiture is, has gotten such a strong um, response and interest in all over um, all over the visual culture in relation to African diaspora. I think that um, someone needs to do some work in articulating what that means today, you know, because it's, there's a lot of virtue signaling in relation to that, where people just feel like they have to collect these black bodies and hang them up on their balls. But I think beyond that cynical idea, there's something really genuine going on. And um, I'm working to sort of with a whole bunch of um, other curators to find a way to articulate and give language to this representation of figuration and black bodies in contemporary visual culture. And is there a, um, is there also a tenant, do you think of photographers or other artists working um, a, against that trend or to, comp or to complicate it? I think people are moving, using that narrative and moving with it. I mean, if you think about the work of Alfredo Jar, Searching for Africa in Life, I mean, it's about these, the, the form, these modal modalities, if you think about it, it's, you know, he's got this, he's created Time uh, Life magazine covers and juxtaposed them in secrets. And you've got over 2000 covers and just the visual representation of over 2000 Time Life magazine covers just shows you, demonstrates to you the way Africa is deleted from visual culture or from history, from, from any sort of, I mean, these are, we're talking about majority world people sort of obscured from any sort of representation. And so it's not surprising that the moment that people have the ability to write their own narrative, to write themselves into history, they see it with both hands. Um, that's, um, that's something that Mark Seeley and I talked about too, and, and has found in um, the work he's done at Autograph uh, since he became director there and um, just fostering um, that imagery as being uh, just a place to start, just a place to start. It's important to also represent the imagery in its mundane, most um, disinfected form. You know, you don't have to be doing anything. You know, we just have to get used to seeing black bodies just existing or at play or in sort of whimsical scenarios. You know, we don't have the, the burden of, of um, social discourse, I think is anathema to creative expression. So after a while, it becomes something that cannibalizes itself. And I actually encourage this sort of representation of mundane scenarios this sort of representation of what that apparently isn't serious. Because I think there's a radicality that is represented in this visual impression that we don't often see, you know, middle-class black family with a, um, a nuclear family just sitting around doing nothing. I think, you know, if you really think about it, that is not often represented, that is not seen. And I think um, artists, are tired of it. Society is tired of it. We want to, you know, not just represent the survivalist mode or modality. We want to show the humanity in its broadest, richest form. And that happens by representing play, fun, love, um, family, social scenarios that have been taken out of um, art history, if you like for the last millennia. Home. Home, the, you know, the, the museum is home or home is museum too. Um, Max, do we have any questions that have come in? Nothing yet, but um, you know, uh, the, for the audience, if you have a question for either Azu or uh, Stephen Evans, um, you know, please go ahead and submit them. I selfishly have written down a bunch of questions <laughs> that I have for you um, because you've really, you know, I'm, I'm 
for those who don't know me, um, who are watching this now, I'm the associate curator at PhotoFest, um, and I'm, I'm just at the beginning of my career. So this has been incredibly inspiring to hear all of the amazing projects that you've worked on and the, and the deep thinking that you've done. Um, I'm really curious to ask you, Azu, about the institutional and exhibition models that inspired your approach to curating, organizing, and directing projects. Um, specifically, are there projects that inspired your approach to exhibition making um, stuff that you learned about when you were um, just starting your research and just starting your practice, or perhaps there are people that are important uh, predecessors to you? Oh, yes. Um, of course, we yeah, have the one of my favorite, and I still work with her, the Clementine Dillis, and the work that she did in uh, the World Culturian Museum, where, I mean, this is a super ethnographic museum, right? Mm -hmm. With a, you know, its strict modality. And she invited contemporary artists to really work with ethnographic objects. And then we're talking about fashion designers, we're talking about musicians, we're talking about um, tailors, we're talking about photographers. But um, to look at things that nobody ever gets to see, these objects at the back of the storage in uh, an ethnographic museum, and um, to reconceptualize, to provide a new context for those objects. And the results from that um, dialogical approach really was, were outstanding. And I think that sort of thinking, that sort of breaking the mold is what I love to do when I you know, approach um, curatorial problems. Um, if I think about um, the exhibition that I, the last exhibition that I did at Zeitz Malka for William Kentridge, where, I mean, William Kentridge is a super, you know, I mean, what can you do? for him or to to inform on his work I mean it's impossible but I said to William at the time you know I cannot you know I really I'm struggling to find the angle maybe what we need to do is sort of open you up to the public sort of reveal the magician's tricks make you know, make the exhibition a studio and um just sort of be generous with your idea, with your approach. And he loved the idea and I was super glad that he went for it. And so we had a room where that we called the studio room, where he sort of broke down his complex production into its finest minutiae. And then we had a reading room where we had a collection of books that had inspired him and, um, and the books that he had produced. So it actually felt like being in the living room. And then we had a bedroom that I really loved where was a room just filled with tapestry. And so this is possibly William's largest ever exhibition, but we had three rooms that sort of decelerated the exhibition and allowed you to sort of take breaths in and to really think of a museum, think of an exhibition as a, as a, as a lecture theater or as an opportunity to reflect or to feel something. You know, because a museum really works when it provides a civic responsibility of allowing you to feel, to think, to ruminate, and to also be inspired. Um, so these are the sort of approaches that I think of when I come into an exhibition. I never think of it as a way of reproducing an old idea. I think, how do we push? How do we push this idea? And I also believe that um, when you think about the theme or the title of a show, you should do your very best to marry it with the way you approach the work. You know, uh, Gail Buckland asked a question that that relates to that sort of like flexibility um, in thinking in terms of um, bridge, like uh, bridging different social and artistic practices together to create an experience in the gallery. And she's asking, um, she says, I love the term collective tissue when discussing the museums of the future, but can you give some examples of exactly what you mean? And I think that's a great question. Well, thank you. That's really, so again, come back to the conversation that Stephen and I had, where why don't we have, you know, museums love this idea traditionally, the 20th century as the very pinnacle of human creativity and expression. Why don't we sort of reverse that and say, why don't we have a museum as an experimental space where we have, um, actually I just visited a museum in um, Tilburg, the textile museum. And because the museum is 
the shop due to the you know the pandemic but the back end of the museum is still very functional and creative and busy because they've got the a workshop they've got a research facility they've got um a library this is what i want for a museum it shouldn't be about oh well you know this is really the highest creative expression possible because what that does it just creates the most nauseous capitalistic rendition of the museum where five major galleries that are represent the artists or present the artists in these institutions. And so we can think of a museum in a different way as a, an opportunity to create a civic space where you've got a room that is designing, you've got another room that is archiving, you've got a space where artists can come in and think and create random juxtaposition of objects and ideas. You know, you've got a space that it really allows young people to come in. Why can't we come into a museum and sit down? You know, why do we live in a museum? Why can't we really learn in a museum? I mean, I think about it in Africa where we have failed governments that are not providing the right sort of education for our people. Why don't we have a space where, you know, someone without a degree can come in and get a history of Africa, a history of of capitalism, a history of socialism, a history of whatever ideas that are that they are interested in in a one hour, two hour space of time and leave inspired and educated, you know? It's great to hear you talk about that because Stephen and I have been um you know, of course, as you mentioned, the pandemic brought up a bunch of challenges. So Stephen and I have been talking about ways to do exactly that, to be flexible, to think about how do we engage the the institution, and um, and that's actually what creative conversations is about. It's like how do we how do we create that space um, for folks um, to engage with art artists and ideas. We had another question uh, for you, Azu. Um, is there any interest in environmental issues within the communities that you're working with? That's such a great question. That is actually the core of everything that we're thinking of. You know, restitution is about ecology. You know, restitution is about creating a secular economy. This is really the, it's about creating the, the survivalist, actually. You know, if you think about all of the objects, some of the objects that, you know, um, that, were, that we highlighted in the slides here, these are humble objects for ecological fishing. You know, if you really think about what interests young people today, if you got, you know, Natasha, um, the, the, uh, the activist from Uganda, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name now, and that sort of generation of young activists who are interested in, um, climate change, global warming, the future of the of our planet. They're not interested in the iconic totemic builders. They want situations that are ecological and the things, the, the objects that they probably want to restitute from these museums will be objects that have an ecological value, you know, like a fish trap that can allow a community to go fish and live subsistently. You don't, you know, unhappily, you know. And so we 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 have a strong ecological environmental focus with the way that we think about museums, the way we think about objects, the way we think about museology, the way we think about the home museum. It's really the foundation and the core of um, the approach that we advocate. And I think if you're talking about a museum as something made up of connective tissue and collective tissue, which I love the play between those two. Um, yeah, it has it has to be that. Yeah, because, you know, the collective tissue is what already exists. I believe that, you know, you should never ever, you know, censorship is the worst thing ever. You know, these objects that exist, these images that exist, no matter how luscious they are, we need to find a way to bring them into conversation. You know, you cannot delete it or you cannot hide it because if you do, then we're going to repeat it somewhere along the line or you get kids saying, oh, this never happened. That's so yeah. just it never happened. But we have to find a way to bring it into conversation and that's the key. 
We have um, one additional question, and uh, I think it's it, it may take you a while to answer it. Uh, it's something that you touched on in your talk, and it's uh, something that I know you give a lot of thought to. Um, what is it about the medium of photography that you find so compelling? And why do you think it's the fastest growing and most impactful art form? That's a really good question. I think number one, the fact that we, it's affordable. You know, you've got these um, smartphones that, you know, with three lenses and, and all the sort of like tricks that it can do. Uh, you've got the Chinese version that are super affordable. And so it really gives agency to whoever owns it and whoever is interested in, you know, you utilizing it and tapping into that power. Um, again, for majority of all people who who story have been narrated by others, to think that you can actually tell your own story with a device you have in your hand, I think that's such an empowering situation that you know, were denied to majority of all people, certainly to Africans for the longest time. So I think that has really facilitated. And, um, you know, if you think about everyone talking about oh, contemporary African art is so important and everyone is interested in it. We've always made art on the continent. It's not a new thing. But the fact that through social platforms, social online platforms, photography, we're able to now share, we're able to now have a voice. We've always had a voice, but we're able to relay that, broadcast that in a visual sense is very powerful. And also the fact that everyone today have the ability to make a picture. It means that it's the most democratic language. We all speak the, the image of photography. We all read images much quicker than our predecessors of our forebears, you know. So uh, the language of photography is the language of the future. Um, I could not have asked you to have a, a better last word to end on. That's perfect. Um, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating hour to spend with you. And um, I uh, am really looking forward to seeing what comes out of the uh, uh, Legos Photo 2020 uh, from the submissions. And um, we'll be looking at that online until we can get there in person. Yeah. And um, I um, just uh, congratulate you on the work that you're doing. And um, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us and talking to us about it and letting us think about collective tissue and connective tissue. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. And thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, have a great night. Thanks, night. everybody. Bye.